here we are. We're doing thermal regulation five, which I have subtitled behavioral thermal regulation. I guess that shows you there's kind of two spellings, two ways to do thermal regulation with the MO and then regulation all is one word, or you could say thermal regulation, like I have it underneath, <laughs> it means the same thing. Behavior then is what the animal does to try to regulate its temperature, you know, in the normal body temperature range. Uh, thermal regulation four was physiological thermal regulation, basically what the animal does unconsciously to maintain the normal body temperature. So now we're going to talk about behavioral choices that an animal makes. And I'm going to try to make the point several times that try to give your animals choices for their environment. If they're confined in a small pen in the back of a yard and it's full sunlight, they don't have any choice at all, right? They're going to be confined to the sun and they're at the mercy of you and other things, I guess, but they can't change their behavior. They can't like seek shade or seek sun if they want to get warmer. So try to have your animals have some choices of their environment and then they can seek out things. And we'll make that point several times. Okay, well, um, here's a horse with a little dog on its back. Not sure the circumstance, but the horse is probably trying to cool off or somebody has it swimming, whatever. We're, since we're doing thermal regulation, I'm going to say the horse got hot and it knows that if it goes into water, the water in this big lake, it looks like, there's some big boats in the background, it's going to be definitely cooler than his surface, right? I mean, there's a gradient between his core and his surface. The core body temperature never is measured on the surface of the skin. There's always a gradient. Heat is always being transferred from the core to the peripheral tissues. And here's the dog. Probably the dog might become hypothermic in that water because that big uh, body of water is basically a heat sink. It's going to keep taking heat away. And I guess this is where I can maybe say uh, that when you're in water, Water takes heat away from an animal's body 25 times faster than if that same animal was just surrounded by all air at the same temperature. Okay, so in this picture, let's say the water is 55 degrees, maybe 65. That horse is going to lose heat to the water 25 times faster than if it was standing on shore and the ambient air temperature was the same temperature as that water. Let's say 65 was the last figure. Very interesting stuff. 25 times faster. Mm. So you can lose a lot of heat in water. Of course, that it's got to be cooler. The water has to be lower temperature than the skin temperature. Now, before we talk about specific things animals can do, I just wanted to remind us that those four heat transfer mechanisms, they call it four physical processes, but I really like heat transfer mechanisms, are going to be operating and then they're going to be altered by the animal, by its behavior. But look at the figure. Uh, in this case, evaporation, there's not a whole lot you can do an animal, but I guess an animal, if it could seek out a drier environment, but that's usually not the case. So that's probably the least one an animal can change. But conduction to the ground here, now this is showing that heat is flowing to the lizard. So that's probably believable. But an animal can lose or gain heat. Remember that for the convection, radiation, and conduction. So an animal can change its position, its orientation. And then down here on the lower left, remember, uh, the lizard is an ectothermic animal, so it's really relying on its environment, whereas our companion animals, the dog, cat, horse, our focus animals, 
are endothermic, which means they're going to be generating heat. And remember, the lowest amount of heat they can produce is called the basal metabolic rate. Okay, so let's do some specific behavioral alterations an animal can do. The first one I've got listed here is basking. Now, I did say in the sunlight to remind us that Basking is a term, if you're not familiar with it, is where an animal can expose itself to the sun. Okay, so got some pictures, of course, to show you. Here's some birds that it's early morning, the sun's out, and they're spreading their wing, wings, I should say, and exposing that those dark feathers to sunlight. And if we didn't say it before, I think we did. Yes, I remember Onyx was showing you this. Black is the best color to absorb the most radiant heat, the thermal heat, right? Thermal radiation. And these birds can face the sun, spread their wings, and then the blood that is also in the wings is gonna carry some of that heated blood towards the body core. Excellent way to harness that heat. Another diagram here showing a lizard doing it. And it's always, the reason I included this is it, there's always more than one mechanism operating. That's the other thing you got to realize. So here, direct sunlight is impinging upon the animal. But then there's also convection occurring, and it might be, might be natural convection, right? Hot air rises, that's natural convection. And then the animal here is in this case, getting some heat from the ground by conduction. And the animal could lower itself and lay on its ventral aspect and have more surface area to the ground and it would absorb or conduct more heat towards the body than if it was standing on its four legs. So that's an interesting thing. And finally, of course, cats are famous for this. The cat is saying, sunbeam, sunbeam, how do I love thee? Let me count the ways. And, of course, you've seen cats doing this, and then they'll, when they're out of the sun, they'll get up and go back to the sun. That's very good. So then the opposite of basking, I guess, is where you avoid the sun, right? So then maybe here we should also say that, hey, an animal can seek shade. And that would be a great way of avoiding this heat load. Okay, and I found this illustration that's titled Behavioral Thermal Regulation. No big surprise there. But it does show how animals can seek the shade and then also bask. And I just, you can look at this, you can pause this whole thing. But here they're looking at body temperature of the lizard. And when it's basking, it goes up and then the Lizard moves to the shade, then the body temperature would go down, and it can do this all day long. And it's kind of showing also the air temperature near the ground, okay? But by alternating between sun and shade, it can maintain a pretty constant body temperature. And then at night, the lizard, I guess I'm calling it a lizard, goes into his burrow up here, B-U-R-R-O-W, and the burrow, since it's in the ground, tends to stay a constant temperature. That's one thing about the ground. You get into the ground enough, and it's basically the con a constant temperature all 24 hours a day. Okay? And maybe I'll make one more, well, another point here. This lizard has free choice. It's using its behavior to maintain a nice body temperature for itself at least during the day before it goes in its hole but a, if a dog did this and had free choice and then the body temperature of course the dog is an endotherm would be constant 24 hours a day but it could go to the sun go to the shade if a dog has water sometimes they go swimming um, can alternate wherever it's at if it has free choice if it's pinned in a small pen in the backyard where there's full full sun then you can have problems very rapidly. Okay, another behavior that can regulate an animal's temperature, heat load, heat loss, 
wallowing. Well, I think usually when people think of wallowing, they think of a pig doing this. And that's true. You know, pigs have that uh, fixed action pattern. They love to wallow. They love to root with their nose, dig holes. And I've seen pigs do this. And then see if they have free choice, then they can dig, lay, lose heat by conduction. And they can get out of the water and lay in the sun, maybe get some heat by radiation, right? And then the water evaporates. So in this sense, they can control evaporation a little bit, although they have no control over the ambient humidity. So if they get out of the water like this pig would and lay on the ground and it's very humid, then not a lot of water is going to do the phase change, which we have previously talked about. But if it's dry, man, you could lose a lot of heat by conducting it away from your body. Usually this water would be considered still, so when water is conducting heat away from the body, that would be conduction. But if the water was flowing like in a stream, then you could say convection. Uh, and you don't have to take this uh, animal any place. But how about this animal? I'm not sure if I would let him ride in the car after this. I've seen people do like mud volleyball, and the mud is with you for days, even if you take the shower. There's always sand Anyways, that's wallowing. And then, of course, this is a free choice again, right? So here's a dog that's wallowed. Okay, now, <laughs> uh, don't let him jump in the car. Don't let him get back on the sofa because man, oh, man. But if he was very hot, this helped him a great deal to cool off. Now, it would be great to clean him up before that mud dries. But if he's very hot, he could go back in there again. Anyway, that's wallowing. Okay, let's talk about another behavioral mechanism animals can use. Huddling. That means to group together, to form some kind of mass. And one thing that that does, I guess let me bring out a picture here. Penguins are very famous for this. I mean, there's maybe a thousand in this pile here. They're huddling. And you know what it does? It decreases the effective surface area exposed to the ambient conditions, the ambient environment. Uh, usually seen more when it's on the low end of the scale, right? I mean, look at what all this does. When you're pressed up against somebody else, then that surface that are that's touching isn't exposed to the environment. And then, if I understand penguins correctly, and I think I read this, like this guy will rotate more in and somebody in will rotate out. So they're always kind of rotating. I don't know how often, but it, the point is you can rotate out for a while, be exposed to maybe the wind, and then go back in. And that brings up the point. I think uh, I will find a wind chill chart since we're looking at this. And, um, you know, they're Definitely the ones in the middle are protected from wind chill. And we need to talk about that because here's one way to decrease your exposure to the wind. Uh, rotate. And it's a very good strategy for these animals. And it's a good strategy for all animals, especially when they're on the lower end, past their lower critical temperature. Look at this beautiful picture of some birds. Um, that's definitely huddling. Right, lots of huddling there, and of course, people have the advantage that we can huddle and then we can also add insulation, we can put more barriers between us and the ambient temperature. And uh, I bet you, if they stay in that huddle long enough, it'll be so warm they'll take their stocking hats off. I mean, it's very effective. That's huddling. Uh, Decrease your effective surface area. You're not exposed to the elements, especially wind, because I guess maybe we haven't said it explicitly yet, but on the cold end of the scale, wind, convection, is your worst enemy, which is what we hear on the radio for humans, the wind chill. And I will find a chart for you. 
Okay, yes, here I have a wind chill chart. It says new wind chill chart, and that's referring to they made some calculating adjustments. I never looked at the charts before and after. It's going to be close. You, even if you find an old chart and you don't realize it, it doesn't really matter. The point is, let's go through this. Here's the ambient temperature. And if you recall the temperature humidity index, there was ambient temperature as one of the factors, of course. And then here we're on the low end of the temperature range, right? I mean, here's 40 degrees Fahrenheit, and it goes down here. Here's zero degrees Fahrenheit, and goes down to 45 below zero, you would call that. And then wind miles per hour because just like i said when you're on the low end of the temperature scale wind chill is your biggest danger of course after the temperature the temperature is the primary thing okay 35 below is 35 below even if there is no wind because here you can see at the top when it's calm you know there's no adjustment calm is the temperature so so again, on the low end of the temperature that our animals live in, and we do, wind convection is the most dangerous thing after the absolute temperature, right? The, not the absolute temperature, I'll just say the Fahrenheit temperature. If you're familiar with temperature, there is such a thing as absolute temperature. Anyway, uh, but on the hot end, remember, then it's humidity is the factor after the temperature. That's the, the kicker. So that's why there's these two charts but humidity is on the other end, the hot end of the scale. On the low end, humidity becomes a very minor factor. You don't even talk about humidity when it's 20 below because it doesn't really do anything. So let's look at this. Let's say it's zero out and it's calm. Well, the weatherman would say, okay, tonight it's going to be zero, but there's going to be no wind, so it's going to feel like zero, right? But as soon as you add wind, then the weathermen start saying, hey, it's going to be zero tonight. And with a five mile an hour wind, we're already 11 below zero. That's the feel like temperature. You should know that if there's a thermometer outside, it's never going to read below zero. These temperatures in these columns are, in a sense, artificial because nothing outside will ever measure those numbers. That's maybe something that people need to clear off. It just basically is a guide for telling us, and we can interpret this for animals too, how much heat we'll be losing. So it feels like, is what the weatherman says. So let's look at zero, and we go down to 30 mile an hour wind. It feels like minus 26. What that's saying is, it's like you're in 26 below weather. So it's kind of like this is like over here right? It's going to take heat away from you as if it's 25 below zero, not zero, but 25, right? So you can get the 25 below two ways. This is actually the dry bulb temperature. And then look at 25. Look how fast you start losing heat. It feels like 60 below, 69 below. Once wind gets so, what, about 30 or 35, it doesn't you're already losing so much heat, you can't lose any more. That's the, that's the reason this ends up being less of an increment, because you're already losing so much heat, you can't lose any more. Anyway, I remember being an 80 below wind chill one time, so I don't know where that was. I don't think it was 40 below zero to get there. I think it might have been using the older chart, and it probably was about you know, maybe 25 below, or may, it might have been 30 below when I got to 80 below. I don't think, I know the wind was very strong. I think the wind was probably maybe 40 to 50, so I was down here, so maybe the old chart would have read 80 below in this area. Anyway, it's very cold. So this is wind chill. Very important for our animals and people, of course. If you have a dog in the backyard and you know it's going to be 10 below and there's going to be a lot of wind, you need to help that animal. If it's an outside dog, maybe bring it into the basement, a garage. I mean, that's terrible because the wind is going to just take heat away and there's going to be 
cold stress inflicted inflicted on some of our animals. Of course, now the Eskimo dog, it's not going to be as affected as greatly because it's adapted. It's been raised for generations in those environments, and it can do a lot of things. It can huddle. It can cover under snow because, you know, snow is an insulator. If you can get under snow or have snow pile up on you, then you're not that surface isn't exposed to the wind. So it might seem crazy, but snow can be an insulating factor. Okay, now I'm going to talk about what I've got labeled body position slash placement. Uh, you know, where you place the body, your body. Let's say if you're a hot dog, you go to some cement floor, you go to a rug, you lay on your side, you keep standing or do you lay uh, so your ventral surface is against the floor that's what I'm talking about now remember these lessons are not exhaustive they're like the first layer of the onion there's a lot of things we could still talk about but I wanted to end my lesson five here on thermal regulation by just talking a little bit about body position placement and again I'm going to say if the animal has like a free choice of environments, can it lay on the rug? Can it lay on a bare floor? Can it lay on its side? If animals are so dense, maybe it can't lay on its side because there's somebody there. Um, if animals get hot, they want to disperse, but if they're too crowded in the situation, you're going to be laying next to somebody and you're not going to be able to cool off like you would want to. So. And I'll put in a plug in for therm, uh, thermal regulation six. We're going to talk about what pet owners can do for their dogs. Because if you've noticed, I've, ne I've kind of avoided that kind of like management techniques for dogs. Okay. Because lesson uh, four was about physiological thermal regulation, what happens unconsciously. And then this lesson was what the animal does. And I've always been harping on if it has a free choice. Okay, I found this funny one, but it does make the point if an animal is standing, then it's only the pads on the feet that are contacting the surface, whether the surface might be hot or cold. So sometimes animals can stand on a surface and minimize their surface area because a lot of times if you're talking about conduction, conduction is totally related to temperature differentials and how much surface is contact. So anyway, the kids are getting uh, fun out of this. That's I'm going to say that's pretty good balance. I don't think I could do that. So there's an animal standing. Here's an animal laying down. Okay, there's a lot of surface area on the floor now. Now if the dog was hot and it was allowed to lay on a cool cement garage floor, you could lose a lot of heat that way, conducting, right? Conducting from the animal into the cement floor. If it was laying on a wood floor, it would conduct less heat away. Metal floors are great if they were solid. Just depends on surface area. Conduction depends on surface area and the temperature differential. Now, an animal on a heated floor can warm up this way, right? So it all depends on what are the temperatures, and you can then predict which way it's going to flow. Okay, so then look at this guy. He's trying to maximize the surface area that's touching the wood floor. So he's going to lose some heat towards the wood floor. Notice he's not laying on the rug. So this animal is probably trying to lose heat, not conserve heat. Okay. And this gets to be like body language of our animals. If you have animals and you have, and they're huddling, that says, hey, they're feeling cold. And maybe you might say, hey, I need to warm up this room or get them in a warmer spot. Uh, it's amazing how they self-regulate, and then you can kind of see if they're telling you something like, hey, it's too hot here, it's too cold, whatever. Okay. I guess I ran into this. I had this figure, so this picture, I'm going to show it. And uh, it shows how in some animals, and I know the kangaroos do this the best, I think, they can spread saliva on their bodies and then have that evaporate. And that helps them lose thermal energy, of course, in that phase change. Rabbits and cats do it as well. So, and I, 
I'm not trying to tell you everything about behavioral thermal regulation, but I had this one and I thought, okay, I'm going to show it. And here's the list of illustrations that I used for this presentation. See you for thermal regulation six, what pet owners can do for their animals.